This is a video in Clinical Medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. The placement of a central venous line is an essential technique in the treatment of many hospitalized patients. This video will demonstrate the placement of a central venous catheter in the internal jugular vein with the use of one of several variations of the Seldinger technique. An additional video on subclavian line placement will be forthcoming. We will demonstrate and review the regional anatomy of the neck, indications for the insertion of a central line, the recommended site and technique for placement of a line in the internal jugular vein, selected complications associated with the procedure and suggestions for how to avoid them, and appropriate care of the line after it has been placed. The placement of a central venous line is indicated for the continuous monitoring of central venous pressure, the delivery of critical or caustic medications, for emergency resuscitation, hemodialysis, and pulmonary artery catheterization. General contraindications for the placement of a central venous line include infection of the area overlying the target vein and thrombosis of the target vein. Site-specific and relative contraindications include coagulopathy. Although this is not an absolute contraindication, extreme care must be exercised in patients with coagulopathy and in other patients for whom complications would be life-threatening. After the procedure has been explained and consent obtained, review the records to confirm that there are no contraindications and examine the patient, concentrating on the regional landmarks. The internal jugular vein can be found at the apex of the triangle formed by the sternal and clavicular heads of the sternocleidomastoid muscle just lateral to the carotid artery. To assure that there is the highest level of sterility, the operator should wear a sterile gown and gloves, as well as a surgical cap, mask, and face shield. Most of the equipment can be found in commercially prepared kits and should include skin preparation solution, sterile towels or drapes sufficient to cover the entire body, 1% lidocaine, sterile 4x4 gauze, non-lure lock or slip tip syringes, which are easy to remove from the needle, a number 11 blade scalpel, saline or heparinized flushing solution, a catheter with the appropriate length and number of lumens, a compatible skin dilator, usually one French larger than the line, an appropriate sized needle, a guide wire of compatible size, which will pass through the catheter and needle, suture, and a needle driver. There are numerous types of central venous catheters to choose from. Seven French triple lumen catheters of either 15 or 20 centimeter length are most commonly used in adults. For resuscitation or dialysis, large bore catheters are preferable since there is less resistance to flow than the smaller bore types, allowing for much higher infusion rates, although large bore peripheral IVs often allow even more rapid fluid administration than central venous lines. For small adults and children, or for those in whom access to the jugular vein is difficult, five French and four French catheters can be used. If there are no contraindications, proceed by placing the bed in a 10 to 15 degree Trendelenburg position to decrease the risk of air embolism and to engorge the vein. Turn the patient's head so that the chin points away from the vein. Generally, the right internal jugular vein is preferred since it provides a more direct approach to the superior vena cava. Remember, positioning is instrumental in the success of the procedure. Identify the triangle formed by the sternal and clavicular heads of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the clavicle. Determine the location of the carotid pulse. The path of the vein runs just lateral to the carotid artery. The needle will enter the skin at the apex of this triangle just lateral to the carotid pulse and will be aimed toward the ipsilateral nipple. Following these landmarks can be challenging in the obese patient. Ultrasonographic guidance is becoming the standard of care in the placement of a central line. It can help to illustrate aberrations in the anatomy, facilitate rapid placement of the central line, and decrease the risk of inadvertent arterial puncture. 
To identify landmarks with the use of ultrasonography, the probe is placed directly on the needle insertion site. The vein and artery are identified on the image as circular and black. The vein is identified by applying gentle pressure with the probe. The non-muscular vein will collapse easily, whereas the artery will remain relatively circular. Prepare the area by scrubbing the skin with chlorhexidine for 60 seconds and drape the site. Be sure to include all landmarks within the sterile field. If the patient is conscious, explain that his or her face will be covered but that breathing will not be obstructed and that he or she can signal for attention by raising his or her hand. Flush the lumens of the central line with saline or heparin and ensure that the guide wire threads easily through your needle. Remove the cap from the port through which the guide wire will be threaded. This is commonly the longer lumen. If using ultrasound, prepare the ultrasound probe with a long sterile sleeve, being careful not to contaminate the sleeve prior to placing it on the sterile field. During the placement of the line, any assistant or observer should feel empowered to halt the procedure if there is a break in sterile technique. Confirm the needle insertion site again. Generally, it is at the apex of the triangle, just lateral to the carotid pulse. During needle puncture, palpation of the carotid artery can be maintained with the non-dominant hand. In a patient who is awake or minimally sedated, the skin should be infiltrated with a local anesthetic, such as 1% lidocaine, with a 25-gauge needle to help minimize pain on insertion of the catheter. Using the insertion needle, approach the site at a 45 degree angle from the coronal plane with the long axis of the needle directed toward the ipsilateral nipple. Puncture the skin at the apex of the triangle at the medial border of the sternal head of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, entering just lateral to the carotid pulse. Advance the needle while applying gentle suction to the syringe. Continue to aim toward the ipsilateral nipple at a 45 degree angle to the skin, avoiding penetration into the deep tissues of the neck. Typically, the vein is accessed at a depth of less than one half inch or 1.3 centimeters. When using ultrasonography, watch for the shadow of the needle to appear on the image. The needle can then be followed into the vessel with ultrasonographic guidance. When the internal jugular vein is entered, a flash of venous blood is obtained. Because of the collapsibility of the vein, this commonly occurs while the needle is being withdrawn, which tents the vein. Once the needle has entered the vessel and steady blood return has been obtained, maintain a steady position of the needle with the non-dominant hand while gently removing the syringe. Dark, non-pulsatile flow confirms access to the vein. Once the needle is in the vein and free flow of blood has been obtained, employ the introducer. Using the introducer, advance the curved end of the guide wire through the needle. An assistant should watch the monitor, looking for signs of arrhythmia during advancement of the guide wire. Arrhythmias indicate that the wire has reached the heart. If arrhythmias occur, withdraw the wire slightly until they cease. After the guide wire has been inserted, withdraw the needle, leaving the guide wire in place. As the needle exits the skin, be sure to grasp the guide wire at the skin. At this point, only the wire remains in place. Using an 11-blade scalpel, make a small superficial incision at the entry point of the wire to facilitate passage of the dilator through the skin. Be careful not to cut the wire. Place the dilator over the guide wire being certain to maintain control of the wire at all times in order to prevent a wire embolism and advance the dilator one to two centimeters by holding it close to the tip and rotating it. Be careful not to introduce a bend or kink in the guide wire. Remove the dilator anticipating increased bleeding. Maintain a grasp on the wire. A 4x4 gauze pad can be applied to the insertion site to minimize blood loss. Once again, only the wire remains in place. Now, feed the catheter over the guide wire, being certain to maintain control of the external end of the wire before advancing the catheter through the skin. This usually requires that the wire be pulled slightly out of the patient 
until the external end of the wire extends out of the catheter hub and can be grasped. While grasping the external end of the guide wire, advance the catheter over the wire using a rotating motion. If resistance is met, the track may not have been adequately dilated. Remove the catheter and try again to insert the dilator. Insert the catheter to a depth that places the tip at the junction of the superior vena cava and the right atrium. Remove the guide wire and check for blood return in all ports. Flush all ports, place caps on the hubs, and secure the line in place. Apply a sterile dressing. Obtain a chest x-ray to assess for proper placement and to assure that no hemothorax or pneumothorax has occurred. All sharps should be properly disposed in approved sharps containers. Scalpels should be retracted into their protective sleeves. Needle stick injury can be minimized by using needle lock devices found in most commercial central line kits. There are some common problems that can occur during placement of a central venous line. Puncture of the adjacent artery is usually obvious if pulsatile or bright red blood flows into the syringe. However, in patients with hypotension, hypoxemia, or both, it may be difficult to differentiate placement in the artery from that in the vein. The possibility of this complication should be recognized before the wire is inserted. If the catheter is in place, and its location in the artery is suspected, the line should be connected to a transducing system. Pulsatility or any pressure higher than 30 millimeters of mercury or approximately 30 centimeters of hydrostatic pressure is probably arterial in nature. Ideally, transduction should occur before the wire is passed and should be performed routinely. If arterial puncture occurs, remove the catheter and place firm direct pressure on the site for 10 minutes or until there is no further bleeding. Occasionally, air may be aspirated into the syringe. If this occurs, check the syringe to be sure that the needle or catheter and syringe are firmly attached. If so, immediately remove the needle or catheter since there may be a pneumothorax at that site. This is especially important if the patient is having symptoms of increasing respiratory distress. Immediately obtain a chest x-ray and insert a chest tube if necessary. For persistent bleeding at the catheterization site, apply direct pressure and check the results of coagulation studies. Replace blood products as necessary. If bleeding continues, there may be an arterial or venous tear that requires surgical exploration. In any of these circumstances, do not attempt to place the line at the opposite site since you risk contralateral pneumothorax and further respiratory compromise. If arrhythmias are seen on the monitor, the line may be in the heart, in which case the line will need to be pulled back. By approximating the necessary length of the wire before catheterization and confirming its placement with a chest x-ray, this problem can be avoided. Always be sure to work within a sterile field when placing a central venous line and to keep the site clean after placement to prevent local or systemic infection. If the wire will not thread through the needle, you may need to adjust the placement of the needle since it may have inadvertently been advanced during manipulation. If so, adjust the needle and re-aspirate to be sure that you are still within the vessel. If you are unable to re-establish blood flow, remove the needle and start over. If the vein has been difficult to cannulate, the presence of a clot in the needle will further complicate assessment of whether the vein has been successfully entered. In this circumstance, remove the needle and flush it thoroughly with saline to clear it before reattempting placement of the line. A sterile dressing should be placed on the insertion site. The dressing should be changed daily and whenever blood or liquid accumulates or it loses its seal. In order to minimize the potential for infection in the central venous line, the following precautions should be observed. The number of times the line is accessed should be kept to a minimum. Each time the line is accessed, this should be done under either sterile or clean conditions. The access site should be prepared with an alcohol-based solution. 
there should be a daily assessment to determine whether the central line is still needed so that it can be removed as soon as it is no longer necessary. A central venous line is a convenient and often necessary tool in the treatment of the critically ill patient. However, one must always be aware of the potential for infection.